Um, okay, and I don't know, I'm Andreas Mishka, I'm at CoreOS. Uh, I'm one of the few people at CoreOS now. Um, other than the other distributed systems in the year, we're done SCD, and I'm going to talk a little bit about SCD for sure in this talk, um, as well as sort of a database guy in general. That's what I do graph databases on the side. And so, let's see, just come right in. Um, I was up in Hamburg for CCC uh, back in December when I saw Gabriel Monroy do this. And it's a, and I, you know, saw this and I'm like, that's actually sort of inspired. He's also a little bit off. Um, because what, he, what he's trying to obviously do is based it on the you OSI know, model. Right? All the way from the physical layer up to the application layer. Every layer depends on the layer below it. There's some other you know, niceties. And some of these can actually be combined. So, I wrote a blog post and furthermore, a great way of describing a lot of what CoreOS does uh, by talking about the layers sort of as well as it, uh, forking the idea and, and running. Uh, and we have each, each of these are basically the open source projects that CoreOS does and how they all build up to layers actually sort of a cluster system, ecosystem. Uh, and I've got sorry, everyone of these. So just to you know, shout out from the beginning, which is the hardware, instead of having multiple layers like virtualization, VMs, and so on, really we can, that is what a VM does. It extracts the hardware of it. We can go out to Amazon, we can go out to DigitalOcean, we can go out to Google, we can do whatever. And we can pick up a set of CPUs, a set of you know, RAM, by right up the shelf. Uh, we can also shout out to the rapid bases uh, to uh, um, let's see. So then the next level up is yeah, well, I'll talk about that. But you're gonna see that slide again a few times. It's my the VLS. Um, and what's cool about CoreOS and a lot of what we're talking about here here is is reducing the API on the OS itself. So in you know, traditional distribution, right, looks more like this. We've got the kernel and the one, uh, plot devices, everything taken care of. We've got our versions of Python and so on that we're running, and then you run that on top of that. And this is the way like configuration management and so on tools set up. And you have to make very careful what version of Python you're running, what version of Java you're running, make sure that your app and is what it, you think it is in general. And well, what if we actually can move that line back, right? What's the minimal set of things we need to call it an OS? It's really not much. It's mostly just the kernel, the lines, and other things around it. Because the, the other thing we can do then is containerize our applications up to and have different versions, say OpenSSL 1 or 2, Java different versions, perhaps. Uh, and this is sort of like the initial thing of why containers is cool. Because we can separate these, you know, the user land, really. And this is the, that's important in user land from a kernel space, in a sense. Um, so, once we do this, that's kind of like where people start out. Because we can develop this way, we can develop packages, because that's kind of what they are. Uh, package management for a new way. Uh, that's basically just you. So, you know, the OS, but when you do this way, the OS has some powers, which are, you can automatically update the OS underneath your commands. You can we do this in ProOS. We are in ProOS Mad Linux, which does ProOS uh, automatic update. We, we have hard to do in a couple hours with a few amounts, uh, at least on the OS end. But then there's a whole other thing. You know, this is the set of software, which is very minimal. You know, base OS being the kind of app user is very important. Once you get to the OS end. Well, what we're trying to build is a cluster, right? So I could just put my containers on ProOS and Build out being happy. But we want to build a cluster. So, this is the first layer. What we need to actually start talking about a cluster is some notion of consensus. And this is what SCD and Common Souls and Cooper, all these other tools do, is you can track, you know, it's really designed so that things can fail. Right? So, we have um, a small amount of data that we want to keep consistent across the cluster. So SE did that, right? It's sort of SE distributed. Or maybe it's a daemon. It's kind of both. Um, and 
Yeah, that's right. Right. You want open source software. It's open source. It's potentially consistent. Uh, we think this is potentially consistent again in a second. Uh, you know, over HTTP, so it's really common to use it in the with. And you know, can figure out that. So here's our normal RTG cluster, right? Highly available. We have one you know, leader, multiple followers. And you can ask any of them for data and here we go. Of course, as things go away, we're still available. But it's, and we really care about the moment we lose one. When the um, majority of machines no longer be reached, that's when we have to actually stop everything we're doing. And we no longer make progress. And so what is progress? Uh, uh, really unavailable. Sorry. There's also a master election, leader election, which is to say, if the leader itself goes down, we have to be able to fail over to another uh, node in the ACD cluster and on the go. So what is it we're trying to keep consistent? And what we're trying to keep consistent is this log. The log is just your data. As it's looked at from a sort of longer, sequentially consistent view. And that's important to create for one second. But these are all entries, these are indices in time. You can think about them as you know, time, but really we don't care about times. Time has you know, the same, well, it seems to be executed in the same order, but here's an example. So we have, we say put, you know, a fact about type is a cat, and then we change it among the code to be wrong. That's what we do. And over time, that goes across the thing. And we think about these things often in real time. Like I set this thing at time t in five seconds to five milliseconds. But really, if we start asking about these things in terms of time, like if we get 10 at 10, 10 o'clock on one server and we get 10 o'clock on another, we're going to get two different answers. We start thinking about them in terms of index time, which is the log of the And so if I say get 10 at 2, now I know I don't have 10 o'clock, which is an arbitrary time. I know exactly what index it is. I can get that consistently you know, at a dog and it'll block on any server that does not know what. You know, the next two is until finally the value is This is how we can guarantee that at any index x with all these terms in the And that's important, right? That means that if I have a uh, service code and I'm running in across a cluster and I'm able to find one that moves, it goes away without having so many methods. Uh, everybody uh, can always ask SED, right, where it exists right now. Yeah, it's just, this is important. Um, and things too, like uh, who's, who's in charge, who's the you know, master, leader election, um, things like the locks. Right? These are all the primitives kind of that build into building the distributed systems from the ground up. Clone uh, gets. So, another thing you can do, obviously, is do a get which says, I don't know what it is right now, but make sure everybody return only when everybody agrees. The form is like that way, same sort of way. I want to call out uh, appers, create posts, uh, and call me a user. You have to see them there, awesome. And this is the you know, you know, visualization. Because what we care about in CD land is that things be uh, sequential, right? I said sequential consistency because that's and the first level we can actually handle that's you know, consistent in uh, distributed world. If there's anything less than that, we can't be sure that it's anything um, as much as we have. Uh, form gets incidentally become unrealizable uh, if you think about that way. But the important thing to note is that right, you have strong consistency. You can actually do that. Um, so yeah, super powers. So the configuration data is this whatever you're building across hosts, designing to host values, Consistency across those, right? And because of this, you know, we now have our kind of first, first layer that goes between a cluster and you know individual machines. If you think about that, like SCD or an SCD proxy or something like that is running on every machine. And then the stuff above it can now access this, right? And they can have some guaranteed view of the world, or at least metadata of the world, uh, around everything. So, the next level of writing is the cluster resources, which is what do we have when we put all these machines together? And for what, yeah, there's a lot of examples. There are some, well, we're not as important for this. Like I said, we have distributed locks. We can talk about 
these sorts of things. And this is, you know, so what can we provide? Now we have an entire cluster we can do at one time. And this is things, you know, the traditional sort of things we can never provide, which is network is computing um, on a group list because that's going to come up in a second. Um, but for this example, for instance, I'm going to talk about network. The one thing one of our other projects is for OS is final. And what final does is for whatever services you like, usually for containers, in providing an IP for a pod or a container pod or something like that. Uh, we can discuss, you know, running a network on top of all the other layers. We talked, I've heard some other talks today about uh, networking and how do you ensure that they can talk to each other. Uh, so, my personal opinion, by the way, that you have, so this is some, somewhat, this is equivalent to some sense to the layer of the OS, but on the cluster level, right? This is looking at the devices that are available um, so, final. Well, your dog, I heard you like lands, right? but frames you need to be seeking network like network. Because this is what it's doing, right? It's literally building a network on top of a network. It's, but the notion being that this network is how it right? And the only way you can achieve this can achieve, again, consistency, because it can depend on SUV. You say, hey, you know, this is IP, it's delegated to the machine. Nobody else has it. We agree on that. So, because partition IP range and a point of consistency and speed. One of the other nice things about Firewall on the call is it uses the XLAN, which is pretty reasonable to the account, which means that you can avoid user space to uh, actually make it really fast. There's a little bit of latency overhead, but you can do that. So, Firewall is now it. And Firewall is just one example, though. This is the same thing you run. Um, individual kubelets, right? You can go on every machine, talk about Kubernetes, and you have an operator. Uh, things like possibly combining all the disks into one large distributed block storage, like stuff to run on all the machines. These are all the resources. Final, you know, a very simple example. Or not a simple example, good example. Uh, but this thing allows the next layer up. So uh, this is why I'm building up every layer. And what's furthermore, you can sort of see where I'm going next, which is if this is the hardware of the cluster, then orchestration is kind of the OS of the cluster, which is orchestration being worth the servers. Where you've heard, I think Jesus calls it their data center of OS, and I think that's half the name actually, because of this reason. You have you, know, you calling the orchestrator API, writing, which presents a scheduler network namespaces to hold it to the machines, and takes something. Doesn't know yet, much like an that number player takes some user data I don't know yet and is able to encapsulate it some data. Uh, of course, the way it does this, this is a very simple example of the scheduler, right? Which is while I'm waiting around, uh, if there's some state I need to be in, like running four copies of this web app or whatever it is, I don't know what to do in advance, and with my box the scheduler, I can actually look out to the cluster, look out to the sources I have, and put it. And that's exactly what it is. This is a simple example that was also given. I think that it's also probably going to be in this talk. That is very simple. Because that's exactly what they do, right? Um, they are able to have an API by which you can say, here's something, run it. Because it knows where everything is because of the layer of water. They can get this. Uh, so there's a bunch of Projects in this space. Read is a very simple one that we came up with earlier. Um, it's basically system B, except for like running in another cluster. Uh, Use this, this kind of user sphere. Uh, Kubernetes, for All these projects are really cool, and this is what they do. This is what they do. Um, so, their point is to think about app capacity first, right? Which is how many of these do I need? Just like capacity across the cluster. What can I build? Take advantage of the resources involved, and of course, because it's consistent and depends on that, you can ask for it. So we built the Kubernetes. And finally, we actually get to containers. And this is the whole point of the big thing, right? Which is we divorced the OS from user space within the early slides, right? And so what is a you container know, exactly? It's sort of the user space problem. If you think about it that way, it's that's almost as simple as it gets, right? It's, it seems like there's no magic in that statement. Of course, 
And what we're trying to do, right, is far far up use the land. I mean, heck, we're around the corner from the Free Software Foundation, but people find good new lands because the lands of the current one didn't use the land, right? So we can sort of lift that part up from the OS layer into an higher layer that runs sort of abstractly on the cluster. So we want to pull something from the fix and rope it down on the actual one. Um, but there's a lot that goes into this, right? Which is, I need to isolate the one, I need to have an isolated DNF group user, I need to have network and devices, and not buy, not buy mounts and C groups and everything you need to actually run a container, like, hopefully separately from everything else. This is largely done, I mean, this is kind of like Docker, but also Rocket to a degree, right? Rocket is consistent with the end is hooking into these features that are exposed in the kernel, or hooking into features that are from Solaris or the DSP jails, and all these things that limit these resources such that they can run actually execute in some sort of sentence. Um, and how can you do it? Well, if they're just normal, like I said, <coughs> with some with an execution environment, then we can actually do them like that. We write this to GitHub. Build in our CI system, upload it to a registry via play.io, which has an access to those guys in the and you know, pull them down to our hosts. And you can pull them uh, arbitrarily, you can do them at various versions, you can build pods, you can do them as well, and pop it up. Um, so, yeah, you have to kind of all that. And of course, your application is the thing you're building. You can put it in the on the previous slide. That's all there is to it. So, you just, you know, kind of looking at the whole slew of things we've got going on. Uh, so, like today, right, or at least old model, right, is to have, you know, a physical layer, a Linux distro, and an application on that. We set up chat for something to build this. Well, right. And sure enough, it works. Like, we set up our server, we set up our MySQL server, we set up our last server, we get this going. With replica, uh, you know, uh, replicas and so on. Set up, but then version skews start to happen. Patches start to happen. They don't always come out quite the same all the time. The main last search depends on an older job that you're running in your application. So, you know, if you're looking at this again, this is an old version of the slide. Um, <laughs> and so you have our cluster, right? And the notion that what we want to get to is something goes weird or something goes down or something goes down for output. You know, the actual machine doesn't matter. The rest of the thing is the rest of the cluster, the sort of virtual cluster we built, just like we built the virtual land, so we built the virtual everything else, stays alive, things migrate, uh, the fellow doing uh, user land, uh, soft positive stuff, also very cool stuff, makes you know, things like this more magical. And, and you know, eventually the thing comes back online and down the end. But because we have this consistent view of the world, we have been uh, I know I talked really fast, which is intentional because I looked at the references then. Uh, it doesn't look better at that. So, yeah. yeah. When you're talking about Raptor, your, yeah. your, your diagram was showing what would happen if the node goes away. Yeah. So what happens on the network segmentation where you actually have two clusters running at that point? Great question. Because I would like to slide, actually. It's supposed to be. The next slide, and because in some sense, right, you can look at a partition as equivalent to machines going on, right? And if that happens, then you're going to have some form of them on one side of the partition and some number on the other side. And if there are enough partitions that nobody can gain form, then nobody's going to be able to make progress in the long run, right? There's one of progresses if at least each one of the machines can see them. And so, in some sense, you can, I like to analogize it to a, like a red, where you have so much failure you can handle, and then once you've gone beyond that, well, you do the lost data in the case of the red, or you no longer make progress on your data in the case of the red. So, if I have a, a, a cluster of three in the mm -hmm. form, and then a cluster of two, the network partition goes away, is there a reconciliation process that can happen? Yes. In fact, it's uh, guaranteed to be able to happen because everybody on the small side of the quorum wasn't adding anything in the time. And then on the actual quorum side, 
That's that's where the uh, that's where the sequential the sequentialness of the logs becomes important. Yes, but it is very important because then once it's sequential, one's not making progress. This other side is making progress, and he's copying that. Thank you very much. So what is for us doing the OS itself versus Kubernetes? Yeah. So CoreOS is basically working together with Kubernetes, right? And in fact, largely what I'm talking about with the whole stack here is kind of what makes up the con. Right? Is that whole department, which is everything. Uh, so Kubernetes is what we use for the scheduling, you know, cross things. CoreOS is just the baseline that we use in order to run the What's our execution about? Right? How do we get to the kernel features, the CDs, you know, interfaces, and so on? I need to like containers to run. Well, we have just enough to make that happen, which is for OS, and then full stack is what goes on. Yeah, you actually, I kind of put up a thing about the whole container management architecture as one of the open center things. Mm -hmm. And you have something that's like under the center. Yeah. Because, I mean, what I've done, I'm new to the space, and one of the things I did was I just went to Google and I typed in something like Docker versus, and then Google comes up and puts something, right? And it things come up like Core OS and Mesos. Right, there's a lot of things in this space right now. But the thing is, like, I'm not able to find, like, this is probably like the first diagram I've seen like this. It's kind of broken up into different areas and started to list different products that they do. At the same time, though, uh, like, Mesos goes into, like, Cluster area. Oh, that's how it listed in orchestration. So then there's like this whole. The, column this is, type this is yeah. The, it, so is this like the way that everybody thinks about it? Answer clearly not, right? It's, you can start to combine some of these things and say that, oh, okay, I'm going to have the orchestration that also take care of you know, managing resources or also be the thing I run that, uh, you know, get into consistency or something, right? You can sort of take these pieces. And what's funny is that's actually, that was actually through a network, too. I got the access to the other protocol back in the day. They used to combine these things. So, I mean, there, there will be a, you know, eventual thing that people tend to agree on, but it's, you know, it's kind of open season right now. <laughs> <laughs> Just like it was in that way. Well, Monroy gave the talk that you referenced in the beginning, the seven layers. Yeah. Um, he, he complained bitterly about the fact that there's no clear separation between the layers, and that's actually causing us a lot of headaches in this And I've mean, driven differently than he did. Uh, I mean, I consider infrastructure, physical, and virtual to be the same thing. I think, right? I think of them as boxes that contain you know, TPU, memory, disk. That's about it, right? And that's all they need to do. Like, you, know, you could actually think about them. But there's no clear way yet. Yeah, there's no accepted standard. Right. For some, for someone like me that it's new, um, you know, I'm hoping to come to something like this. And it, it, what I hear is like someone's used something and they're kind of just sticking with that, and they pick one and, and look at that, right? These are these are all fairly complicated. These things are trivial to get yeah, these things these running. Yeah, right? And the idea for me was to come here and maybe get a group of people together to kind of talk about, yeah, I, I played with this one and this one, and maybe those people can provide some insight into why they chose one of those, but then maybe someone played with these two other ones. And that sounds like a great session. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what I meant about the architecture, but I mean, maybe that's, maybe that was a different, um, I don't know. I'm so yeah, for choosing your architectures, right, there's a lot of choices, right? At least trying to break it up is an interesting question, as well as talking about people's success or problems with any individual piece of it, right? I could, I, I, I think that's a use like very stable. It just has probably a few fewer features and says we keep it or also right now, but it also is like very simple and stable. So there's you know trade-offs and different people using different things. So a lot of the other sessions talk about the things called Docker. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> you guys also work on Rocket. Yes. You um, did a non funny TLDR version of Rocket. 
you know, I get asked this a lot of times. Um, yeah. and, and <laughs> an on-screen version of Rocket Race Talk. The answer is, actually, we love to collaborate, right? We want focus back, right? We want one thing that we all agree on. You need to be known about what things need to uh, exist, right? We know that we are using procedures, we know that we're using all these things, the whole features that exist. Everyone who's in the room, this is how it's supposed to be, so how can we sort of agree on what this fireball looks like and what's required to run? If you think about it just as a fireball, like I said, then you need to think about, you know, okay, what requirements does it have? And I kind of, so yeah, we love to, like, uh, there was a great thing up by Red Hat, Kelsey, really like, um, that says, yeah, I think you should work together on this, and everyone should, right? you just try and to be so in the presence of. <clears throat> But assuming that doesn't happen, um, what they say right now, why would you use, what would be the best case for Rocket versus Power? Uh, the best case, in my opinion, it, it has to do with a lot of, well, there's kind of two things that I like sort of better about Rocket. One of the things about Rocket that's really well. Yeah, the Rocket files are relatively pretty cool. Um, the Rocket files, uh, Docker, in terms of like the developer experience is really nice. Uh, there's some of that is really good. One thing I like about uh, Rocket is that it's uh, being as simple as possible as saying system B. System B has this thing that's pretty standard. It's supposed to do that. Um, it's not very fancy, but it also kind of works. Um, another thing that I like is uh, the reputation and security. We're paying a lot about this, especially with the registry folks uh, in New York. We're paying a lot about how can we verify the bits that we're calling for actually the bits that we're executing. And trying to make that go all the way up from all the way up to that, right? Which is saying, I have this hardware, I have the hardware to have the PPM, I have you know, this, and my OS supplier is verified, which you know, for us, if you don't have the other, and so you progress. And all the way up, right? So that when I'm executing a thing, I know that that's what I'm executing. I can be very And that's actually a really nice thing for things like that, where you're building. Um, so if you're building a container and you're giving people the, the, the ability to build whatever they want, yeah, they could try and break out of that thing. But if I just say, no, nope, I'm going to delete that and then make sure that my OS is still verified, then we're good. And we can use keep machines around if it's not verified. <coughs> right. that's, that's kind of the two things we're talking about. Yeah. Hi. Is uh, Docker contributing to the AppSea effort? Mm, we'd like to see. <laughs> <laughs> No, it is, and, and we'd like to you know, have a more of a round table discussion. Well, I'll throw out a comment. I'm, I'm waiting for Rocket to become a little more mature because the lack of a daemon to me is an uh, operation that seems uh, like a much better paradigm. And so I'm, I'm really looking to see if the smoothness that you mentioned in the whole development, the whole developer experience mm -hmm. can be modeled without the, the need for a, a, an overarching daemon to host. And some people really like the overarching daemon. I mean, by comparison, like they want to say, oh, I have this thing that can develop a mechanic. But at the same time, it's, you know, also having to say it one at the same time, right? Having to reboot the mechanics and stuff, the system can do that really well. So, it's, you know, fair. Yeah. See, I like this one a lot. So, you meant uh, you show HD and console in the same. Yeah. Okay. So, what are the basic differences? Most important things. Because um, if you go to consoles page, it says we have the yeah. discovery service for the Right, console has a lot of other services to kind of take in, discovery and so on. Um, they're both based on graph and stuff. Um, we've written a very, very tightly uh, sort of graph that I really like. Um, they have a lot more sort of baked in features. So, my overarching, like, what's good about it? Uh, in that sense, the SED is very small, you know, this area has. Uh, various people before, and then we're kind of going after that. And then I have like doing a bunch of things. Um, you can run my Sky DNS to provide sort of discovery DNS stuff. I thought that's a good that's one of the sort of recommended favorite Sky DNS. Whereas, you know, they can't take it in, which is fine. They run into the question of, you know, what are your needs and sort of how minimal the things you need to take it in. How does CoreOS compare to Rancher 
Retro is. I don't know if we're asking better retro. So, uh, uh, that's an operating system question, not, that's a, not a user land features question. Um, but it's also kind of a user land features question. Because, yeah, yeah, because Rancher Dice Credit takes um, Docker for being a good one. And this is a very interesting place. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at, I mean, you remember all the lining that people did when System D was coming over in yeah, Infinity. I have to <laughs> That's all. I, it's great if you're trusting entirely how to do a big one, but. You didn't talk about is it Terra the the, the orchestra the I guess the content, uh, application layer management mm -hmm. um, I can't think of the name Terraform not Terraform Tectonic Thank tectonic. you I knew, oh, I knew yeah. it was something geologic where, uh, where, where does tectonic live on your layers Tectonic is the layers you think about that way it's all of them it's yeah, it's pretty much all of them right it's core OS and all of the pieces we need to get the Kubernetes and even running off the containers that you know you can buy an image put tectonic on it and suddenly you can just Right. It's, oh, it's, your, it's your stack. Yeah. It's, it's what we, you know, aim to support for our stack. Cool. All right. Cool. All right. Yeah. 